Welcome to this edition of the Deep Dive brought to you by the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel powered by InsideTexas.com. With me as always, Ian Boyd and Paul Waddlington, the X's and O's gurus at InsideTexas.com. Please like and subscribe to the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel. We're getting climbing to 7,000. Help us get there. Also, come see us at InsideTexas.com. We've got a promo code right now, IT1. Get you two months for only a dollar. It does not get any better than that. You get spring game coverage, you get May official visits, and you really get the beginning of the June official visits. So come see us at InsideTexas.com as we dive deeper into a lot of these subjects. Today, we're talking quarterbacks. We're talking about Quinn Ewers, namely. The, the, the Texas starter, the three-year guy coming back for his last season. We're going to look at some of the stuff that, that he does well, but we're also going to diagram some stuff that he needs to improve on because this is a guy that, that has NFL draft aspirations, but he's got a lot of stuff to clean up. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Um, you know, this is a kid that was the at one point had a 1,000 rating. He was the number one player in the country. He was the uh, the, the, the top of the can five-star. The only other two guys ever rated that that high were Vince Young and Arch Manning. So they all have something in common in Burnt Orange. You know, this is a guy that, that, that has, you know, Todd Dodge once said, has an arm that can touch every blade of grass on the field. And, and, and in some cases that's true. But for Texas, I think to maximize their program and him individual, he's going to have to clean up some of this stuff. So we're going to get into it. Uh, Paul, I'm going to let you start off. Uh, you, 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 you put a lot of this together. And it, it's really fascinating because, you know, we the layperson sees, you know, the good throws, the interceptions, but they don't necessarily understand the in-between. And that's what I like you two guys to, to diagram. So let's go ahead and get started, Paul. And I'll, and I'll hand it to you, you know. Give me a little bit of sugar uh, of, of Quinn before we start dicing it with some salt. Sure. I'm going to give you a lot of sugar. Uh, so Quinn showed great improvement from 2022 to 2023. I'll give you just the objective statistics to, to bulwark that point. In 2022, he averaged 7.4 yards per attempt. 2023, 8.8. .8. That's a huge improvement. Uh, 2022, a 132.6 passer rating, 2023, 158.6. That's a 26.2 uh, increase. It's huge. Uh, he also saw a huge dramatic increase in per completion percentage. 58.1 in 2022 as a first-year starter. 69% last year, gentlemen. So huge improvements. Just the objective stats tell you that. And then we saw subjective improvements, didn't we, Ian? Uh, what are some of the things that we saw from Quinn Ewers in 2023 that really hallmarked his progress? Well, they were able to run more RPOs. That's a simple one. Uh, in 2022, they had the Ezekiel's wheel RPO, which is no joke. It requires actual reads, and Quinn was really good at it. But all the other RPOs that I could tell weren't even real reads. They would pretend like it was, and they're like, hey, Quinn, you're, you're going to throw it to this guy. Yep. You know, last year he had way more command of the playbook just to execute simple reads, even in rudimentary concepts. And he obviously gave Sark a lot more options in how to do things because he could actually, he knew how to make the reads, he knew how to make the throws. And uh, that was, I mean, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound like grand praise, but it makes a big difference when your guy can handle a lot of offense and you have, all the packages and all the skill talents that Texas had last year. One thing that I thought Quinn really demonstrated last year was resilience. So we saw some games in 2022 when things went badly and it wasn't all Quinn's fault. There were other contributing factors, but you saw a spiral down to the point where Texas fans were saying, Hey, we probably should pull him. Right. Or should we be leaving him in the game right now? Sark's methodology and philosophy is, hey, they got to work through it. They got to grow. This is part of being a quarterback. Uh, we didn't see those spirals in 2023. Quinn had a couple of tough starts, most notably the Oklahoma game. How did he finish that game? 26 of 28 passing and leading Texas right down the field for what should have been the game-winning touchdown, but we decided to kick a field goal. I still have, I still have some issues with that, gentlemen, uh, but... I think Quinn showed a lot of mental resilience, which is huge at the quarterback position. Because if that guy can't stay on top of the game, even with a tough start, you have no you have no chance, right? It's just not going to happen for you. 
But we saw repeatedly either Quinn never really had a terrible game uh, in 2023. And, and even when he started poorly, he rallied out pretty quickly. Uh, anything you notice with regards to Quinn and running in 2023? There's an improvement over 2022. He did more of it. I <laughs> He did it well. He was obviously a lot quicker. Um, maybe too much, actually. <laughs> he had a fumble against Oklahoma where he was trying to make something happen. Took a shot against Houston when he was trying to make something happen. That one. Um, I don't think that's what got him hurt, but he's not really built for for that. Against Washington, it kept Texas in the game. Washington yeah. played a lot of man coverage, and he just took easy 10, 20 yard scrambles. Um, I that that still needs some calibration, as does some other things we'll get into in a minute, but. No doubt it's an important part of his game. He throws well on the move. He can pick up free yards when they're there. Not everybody even can do that. Is it fair, gentlemen, that we all agree that Quinn Ewers showed substantial improvement from 22 to 23? Enormous, I would say. I, I, I mean, I think Justin? Justin? I, just, I believe it started in the Alamo Bowl against Washington the year before. Because in those bowl practices – Sart chank tweaked the offense a little bit more, more pass friendly. They got to open it up a little bit more. Plus, him losing weight and him really dedicating himself to the uh, to the weight room and and, and 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 taking care of his body. I think it was one reason we saw him a little bit more mobile, a little bit more uh, you know eager to, to to dodge defenders. So we've praised Mr. Ewers and his obvious dramatic improvement, but if Texas wants to fulfill its ultimate ambitions this year. That's an SEC title. That's a national title. That's a playoff team. Quinn Ewers has to still level up again. He has to take yet another step up. And I think there's some good indicators that he can because we're going to show you some things that Quinn Ewers can improve on. We left a lot of meat on the bone in the Texas passing offense last year. And we're going to give you three examples because we don't want to overwhelm you with a bunch of stuff. We want to show you three examples of three touchdowns that should have been but they didn't happen because of a lack of execution at the quarterback position. And we're going to talk about why. So if you're just listening on a podcast, we're going to be descriptive to you. If you are watching as one of our YouTube subscribers, you got to treat because we're going to diagram stuff. We're going to run the videos and we're going to take full advantage of the fair use act uh, of, of this video and talk about Quinn Ewer's mechanics and how he can prove not on these amazing throws or the, the 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 crazy stuff that we know he can do we want to talk about his improvement on the mundane throws and what i'm going to get i'm um, the recurring theme i'm going to offer through this as we break this down is these aren't layup throws they're not layups they're free throws free throws don't require great talent they just require consistency duplicability confidence and the ability to practice something that you can repeat over and over and over. There are many 90% free throw shooters who are not elite athletes or great players capable of wow plays. And I think we're going to reference an Alabama quarterback that Texas coach, that the Texas head coach, Steve Sarkeesian coached, who was a great free throw shooter. Uh, but the NFL is revealing that maybe he's not a great three point shooter or, or reverse jam 360 dunker. Uh, and so what we want Quinn Ewers to do is improve his free throw shooting. And if he does that, and we can add that to his three-point game and his dunk game, we're going to have a real, real good quarterback and a real, real good offense. So without any further ado, you guys ready to break down some tape? Let's do it. The season opener against the Rice Owls. So you see that Texas is pretty clearly going to throw the ball here, uh, single back set. You're going to see a little motion and some play action happen. Uh, cursory at best. Texas has their guy down at the bottom. That is A.D. Mitchell. And you're going to see A.D. Mitchell turn this Rice DB into toast. But because the ball doesn't get there, because of a little pressure, we're going to talk about that, uh, and, but, but mostly because of what Quinn does, uh, Texas loses six points, which should have been a fairly straightforward six points on the board. So let's run it and look at what happens in this play. Okay, at the snap, Quinn is getting the ball. He's going to do a little cursory, uh, half-hearted play-action fake, which you know it's a throw. Right now, you see Quinn is looking downfield. He's getting into his drop, looking good. A.D. Mitchell, if you'll look downfield, stop for one second. 
is now even with the Rice DB who's still trying to backpedal. What's the old expression if a receiver's even, Justin? If you're even, you're leaving. And A.D. Mitchell about to leave, y'all. So Quinn sees his guy. He's already cocking his arm. This is a one-read route. Uh, this should be an easy touchdown. Let's talk about why it's not. Homer, circle that Rice guy that broke free right there in the middle. Yep, that is DeBraylon Carroll. He was the best defensive player on the Rice team. He's actually a good, good football player. Uh, he beats Hayden Connor here, which is surprising since Hayden was actually a pretty consistent pass blocker. But, hey, it happens. It's football. Quinn is going to feel and sense that pressure. But I want you guys to see as you run this, that player is not right on Quinn, okay? He's, he's not hitting him as he's releasing this. He's just threatening him. So can we go back just a little bit? I want to look at that right there. Circle that. Look at his arm angle. Look at Quinn, how far out he has his arm. Look how low he's holding the ball. And look at that arm angle. That is not a good, consistent way to throw a football, gentlemen. And I know that Quinn's strength is off-platform throwing. This is too far off-platform. Yeah. So. I'm going to throw it to you, Ian. What else do you see? I'm looking up top. What do you see with Quinn's feet here? Well, he throws off his back foot, Paul, which is not ideal. Um, he, he's even kind of hopping, which is what, that's what he did against Alabama when he threw it out the back, and then it allowed um, Dallas Turner to take him off the ground and land on him, right? Yes. This is what Quinn – is more likely to get himself hurt in the pocket, I, I think, honestly, than, than outside on the move. Throwing off his back foot is something he got away with a lot at South Lake Carroll. His arm is so ridiculously talented that he can do stuff like this and, like, he even puts the ball somewhat on A.D. Mitchell, right? Or he gives A.D. Mitchell a chance on this throw. When most guys would have no prayer of getting the ball near A.D. Mitchell throwing the ball like that. But he does, and it's just, you know, this happens a lot with talented, physically talented quarterbacks where strengths turn into weaknesses. Yeah, so Ian, what I notice here is, look, he's short-arming it. Not only does he uh, hop yeah. and throw off his back foot, his front foot comes off the ground. <laughs> and You will not find a coaching clinic uh, anywhere which teaches a quarterback to do that. It's like uh, a crow hop in baseball. It's a little crow hop, yeah, and which is, I think, the tie-in of the arm angle, right? Look how far out and extreme that arm angle is. And it's not like this defensive lineman has a hand up and he's going to block it if there's a traditional throw. Quinn's just throwing it that way because he wants to throw it that way. Look at that. That's just, that is not going to be successful. And even as strong as Quinn's arm is, he puts way too much air on this ball. That's the wrong ball. That's the wrong trajectory. It's a little bit of an arm punt. So if you'll go back, uh, you'll see those Rice defenders closing on him. And if you watched it on TV, you're like, well, A.D. Mitchell wasn't that open. No, no, no. Let's just watch A.D. Mitchell the whole play here. Okay, he's going to release. Let's go, Homer. There goes A.D. Even, leaving, gone. The Rice DB grabbed A.D., bound him up a little bit. But you need to still throw that ball to the spot. And if anything, if you're going to err here, you want a little bit of an overthrow. It's better to overthrow than underthrow. You don't want to arm punt this. And I think this is an unfortunate throw for Quinn. Uh, and I think reflective of sort of a breakdown, not only in footwork, rhythm, timing, but also that arm angle, you're not going to make that throw with that arm angle. That's just not effective. So you guys have any closing thoughts on this, this clip? Casey Thompson used to do that some too, and it would burn him. Uh, and he would miss makeable throws down the field. I will say on the underthrow, though, he gets a DPI flag. Sometimes on the deep shot, the underthrow, you give your guy a chance, and that's not so bad. But well, true, the underthrow the DPI, the underthrow, the DPI and, happened on the break, though, not on the throw. He's snatching compromise from the jaws of victory by getting yeah. the flag. Yeah, but the, the, the one point that I would point out about the DPI is it happens on the break. It's not the throw. In other words, he's interfering with him here, right here. He's going to grab his shoulder. That has nothing to do with the throw. So the deep, it's not that Quinn's throw created the DPI. 
Oh, I thought he ran. I thought it was from running into him, but I think you're right. He did also DPI him there, but the the f- officials throwing the flag on the grab. So I think the also the official did the NBA thing where he wanted to see res- the result of the play <laughs> before yeah. he threw it. So if it had been a touchdown, no flag. So true. Justin, any final thoughts on this clip, or should we move to the next? No, one? I, I I think if he overthrows it a hair, that's a, that's that's six. Yeah, I really do. If he plants his feet, he's got a better, more you know. Replicating a uh, uh, deep toss, that that's six. That's a great example, Paul. Yeah, and, and this probably represents the worst degradation of his platform, both below the hips and above the hips. <laughs> like, there's no part of this that he does correctly. And by the way, if any of us mortals attempted this throw, it would go <laughs> like 11 feet. <laughs> like, you know, dribble on the ground and people would be like, what the heck? It's kind of amazing he got the ball there, as many, as many things as he did wrong. So uh, let's move on. And Hayden Connor, I don't know what happened to you there, buddy, but uh, you can't give up that pressure in his face. He was thinking of the next uh, NASA launch. That's right. All right. Well, that's appropriate for Quinn here, Justin. I'm glad you brought that up. Nice tie in, my man. All right. This is Iowa State. And uh, we're going to see classic Heacock defense here in terms of the coverage. Uh, Texas is obviously throwing the ball here. Iowa State knows that. You're going to see flawless protection from Texas and a nice little half roll concept. We're going to, once again, try to free A.D. Mitchell up on the very top of the screen. That is the the intended play call. That is everyone else is a diversion or distraction to grab the safety. And A.D. is going to run a beautiful out and up. That should have been, again, I'm not going to say it's a layup, but it should be a free throw. You should knock down your free throws, guys. So let's run it. Here we go. Little cursory fake. Look, little half roll. All right. Stop right here. A.D. Mitchell is making a nice little fake up here. Number five at the top of the screen. He's making a nice little fake outside. And then watch what happens. Let's ignore Quinn here. Here we go. And bye. (laughs) All right. Stop there. How open was A.D. Mitchell? If that ball is well thrown, I think there's 10 yards between him and the defender when, when it's in the end zone. Yes. He walks in. He 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 could freaking like run backwards and, and talk the guy with the ball. Yeah. So let's go back. We have all agree A.D. Mitchell had it here. We all agree that that was the read. Um, Ian, you had a very good point early in this play with Jordan Whittington. Can you show what Jordan did to, to draw the attention of the safety and help create that? So you got three safeties on the top and the, uh, Homer, if you can circle the top left one. So Ian, this is just, going to be his flyover. And the whole premise of this is you're not going to beat us over the top, right? But yeah. If you you can get them isolated in certain decisions, you'll show exactly how you can crush flyover defense over the top. Ian, lead the way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it depends on the coverage call, but they really caught them here because they, I mean, one of the things that Iowa State is maybe they're three deep, but, you know, you got two tight ends in the box. Maybe they're going to play it kind of run heavy. That guy is his read, Quinn's read. Jordan Whittington is going to run a uh, corner route out route after showing inside and the safety is going to commit to Whittington. When that happens, yours has to know that Mitchell is one-on-one outside with the corner and there's not going to be a safety over the top. When you see the safety commit to Whittington done one-on-one, I got my shot go. And if you watch it, if you, if you can roll the tape when we got about yes, there, you can already tell that the safety was keying on Whittington very early. And so, you know, one-on-one and you just want to anticipate and throw it up for Mitchell. You could throw it before the break. If you gave it enough air, if you wait for the break, probably throw it on more of a line, but very early on Quinn needs to know, I got it. We got the one-on-one, we got the look, but it takes him another couple steps before he actually delivers the ball. And that's, that's, that was a recurring theme all year is he gets right here, gets right here. Got it. Stop. Now watch this little hop step. He's going to a little, he's a little overextended. He's still talented enough that he can make this throw. He's, he's 
mechanically, he looks good right here. Watch this little, little hop step. And then look at the arm angle as he lets it go. Again, way out there, too elongated. It's not that he's just ha like doing a three quarters release. It's 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 too far out. The arm angle is too severe. Yeah. So he sees it, and then he has to set his feet. And then another little extra step is he's kind of watching it materialize. And then what you'll often see, like people, some people think that Quinn Ewer's arm isn't that strong because he throws so many lofted passes. Yep. The reality is he throws those lofted passes because the timing and the footwork isn't there. And so he'll try to make up for it by laying the ball up. And he's insanely good at it. Like the reason he's one of the best intermediate throwers in the world is because he's so good at laying the ball over and under and, and putting it up in the air. But on these outside throws, when he does that, and he tries to make the timing work with his arm rather than his feet, you get this. You get the, the dramatic underthrow. You, you get the misfire. Yeah, and, and what's notable about this, Justin, is it's not just a misthrow. He, he doesn't miss San, uh, Mitchell just on the line of, that he's running on. He misses him far outside. He sails it. So the, the type of ball that he should have thrown is not even correct. He's trying to put air under a ball that he should be throwing flat. Like this isn't, this is, again, I'm not going to say it's a layup. This is a free throw. You, you need to hit, yes, right there. That's your trajectory. Why are you throwing a, a NASA rocket launch? You could make an argument this is a timing route. And when AD gets to go, once he starts his turn from the up, that ball should already be in the air. But that extra second he's taking, that extra second and a half, means all the difference. It's the difference in six points and another the next down. You know what Bill Walsh said? Every route in football is a timing route. Yeah. Troy Aikman probably co-signed that. Yeah. So it's, this is an interesting throw where Texas does everything right, right? Right call, perfect protection, right read. Ian, uh, uh, Ian is right. The, the Whittington route opens up that safety conflict. It makes this a, a, a just an easy read and throw. Quinn, from the beginning, knows that's where he wants to go, but he's a little slow in marrying up the rhythm, and that gets him a little too off platform. Again, if you look at the mechanics of the throw, it doesn't look terrible, right? It doesn't look like the rice throw. But you can see how Ian's point about the little rhythm and of that throw is off, and it leads to this sort of weird arm punt that doesn't marry the route, the, the required throw at all. So that's an oh. interesting clip. Do we have any parting thoughts on this guy? I, I had one to set up the next one. If that's yeah. Okay. Do Before know, do we know go on that, can I just point out, look at JT yeah. Sanders up there in the top corner near the 40-yard line. So – that's a first down. Yeah, and then again, it's Quinn's also a check down. That's not the Quinn's play. making That's the correct. Quinn wants to go with the ball. No, no, Quinn's making the correct read. Yeah, Just throw the seventy-yard touchdown. Don't take the twelve-yard gain. But again, the beauty of this concept, Sark had this dialed up at every level. That whole side of the field, Iowa State's got problems, and uh, we didn't get anything out of it, and that's frustrating. Quinn, uh, there won't be ahead. another DPI. I think there's actually another DPI. Because the underthrow is so bad that the corner runs into him. But um, you know where you know where the timing really matters for a quarterback is on the narrow windows down the field and in the red zone. Here it is. All right. So this was a, a bit of a harrowing game in Fort Worth. Texas didn't play their best ball, but they did pull it out. It, not because of this throw, though. So Texas is in the red zone, uh, distant red zone, right? Uh, we're on what the 13 yard line here, but Texas and Sark and again, AD Mitchell up on the top of the screen, they're going to dial up something beautiful and it is an easy touchdown throw that doesn't materialize. And we're going to look at and break down why you're going to see AD Mitchell make a really nice threatening slant on the inside. He does it so well that if he had just run that route, Quinn could have thrown a touchdown, but you're going to see it's a it's a little bit of a herky jerk route where he fakes the slant and then breaks out, and it's a dramatic outcut. It makes him wide open. All Quinn has to do is just throw it in. 
take a step forward into the throw and put the ball there. But instead, Quinn tries to overplace it, gets weird and hot, caught up in some torque issues and, and, and sails it. So let's run the clip and, and break this down, guys. Again, a little cursory play action. He's dropping back. I love back. how you okay. say that because Stop he's right not here. selling that at all. Stop right here. Okay. He is not selling it. It's it's cursory. He needs, to, right. he needs to look at Brett Favre. Watch Brett Favre's play action. All right. If you look at the top of the screen, you'll see it, maybe the untrained eye goes, ah, A.D. Mitchell's covered. Well, look at the direction A.D. Mitchell's facing and look at the direction the guy covering him is facing. Yes. <laughs> A.D. Mitchell has won. Quinn has played enough quarterback. He knows what's happening here. And by the way, this is the first read, okay? This is a called play. This is Sark dialing up some magic, right? A.D. Mitchell is about to separate. Quinn, if you look at him, everything looks pretty good, except I have one thing I've got a little issue with, and I think it might tie in with Ian's rhythm. Look how far back his arm is, and look how he's holding the ball low. Other than, everything else is right. He's pointed correctly. He's got flawless protection. He knows where he's going with the ball. His receiver is about to dominate this guy, which you'll see in a second when we run the clip. Everything looks good here, except he's got this low ball. His oar's in the water, as the old high, as the old high school coaches used to say. And he's looking at the this. Is he going to be able to throw an accurate ball and take the easy touchdown? Run it, Homer. Let's see. Oh, no. <laughs> He's going to sail it. Did you guys see the little double clutch? That's what got him. That's what bit him. Run it again. Ian, I'm passing it to you. He did this a lot last year. I His footwork is rarely timed up with the route. It's It's like he wants to get to the spot early, and then he'll get there. And he'll look, and it's he's not quite seeing what he wants to see. And then he'll wait and try to make up for the timing with his arm again. Right? So he holds it out, and he just kind of, there it is. And then he throws it. And that is, even for Quinn, it is exceptionally hard to throw accurately, consistently doing that. It needs yeah. to be one. It's the free throw. It needs to be one fluid motion where nothing in your body is working against the fluid motion of the rest of it the double clutch in my opinion is his attempt to get back in the rhythm yeah and of course that's not going to work because the ball's already held back and low and he's kind of that's it's just it's tough man it's just tough to watch because you have such a talented arm in so many different types of routes but again i'm not going to say this is a layup throw but Guys, this is a free throw. And and we expect our college players to hit hit free throws. Uh and again, I want to I want to show AD Mitchell beautiful fake inside and then look even leaving by That's easy. That should be an easy six right there. Uh correct call, great protection. TCU even had a little nominal blitz there that didn't bother Quinn at all. Uh, any any thoughts on this? Are there some I, similarities here maybe between what we saw and in the very end sequence in the Sugar Bowl of, of four tries in the red zone and we couldn't get it in? Yeah, I think we got to note that this, this, this bit where he holds it and then throws, the Oklahoma first interception and the fourth down where they missed beating Washington by that much. Yep. Was the, it was the same thing. He drops back. The timing is not right. He waits. He tries to get the timing with his arm and lofts it, and it's not quite good enough. Yeah, and we we criticized his feet against in the rice play, right? Feet are yes. perfect here. Perfect. But as Ian said, he's not timed up. He's not rhythmic. And that little double clutch from a low – holding. look how low that ball is and far back and at a weird angle. That little double clutch – I don't care how talented your arm is. That's tough, man. That is it, tough. Do you think he wants to see it before he throws it? Yeah, I think yes. that one he wanted to see it before he threw it, clearly. Yes. Because he could have thrown it. He could have thrown it when AD Mitchell was even with the guy, right? 
it's like you said, his footwork is actually timed with the route properly here. But he doesn't trust that timing and he wants to see it first. If, if he throws it when he's even with the DB, that's a touchdown. Yep. I'm so that, we've seen three plays where at least not the first one, the second, that extra second and a half that he's taking feels like a lot of the difference. So gentlemen, is the takeaway here that we need to completely reconstruct Quinn Ewers, uh, that he needs <laughs> to hold the ball up high and, and have that tight, you know, classic NFL teaching, or no. do we need to tell him, yes, you could throw off platform. It's one of the things that makes you special, but when you've got the free throw, I need you to find a consistent delivery mechanism within your delivery that you can be duplicable, replicable, and consistent throwing these balls that on a difficulty level, guys, these last three clips are somewhere between a two and a half and a four and a half out of 10. And for a college quarterback who aspires to go to the next level, those need to be touchdown passes for the University of Texas to maximize. And he's going to be throwing in these same routes and these same plays to a completely different cast. And I wonder, you know, he had a little bit of, 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 of a repertoire with Xavier, two years. AD, they only had that year. And with these guys coming in, now he's had extra work with Jonte and DeAndre Moore, but with these other guys – you got to make sure, and, and this will be something we can watch in the spring game because you can pick out these little details to see how much he has grown. And that's that's what I want to – I think you need to see, you know, if we're going to talk about things to work on. I think that's something that he could polish up easily. I think uh, the promising thing is footwork for a quarterback is usually a function of work ethic and discipline and then already knowing where you want to throw the ball and developing the footwork that allows you to serve that goal. So like people will talk about Aaron Rodgers, the ultimate like footwork guru, off platform yes. guru. So much of what Aaron Rodgers did was he was like, I want to throw the ball here at this point. And so I'm going to work on my footwork that allows me to be in a rhythm to do so. Right. Yeah. Tom Brady would do all sorts of drills to be able to move in the pocket against different kinds of pressure and still be able to throw. I think Quinn is going to benefit a lot from just one more year of knowing where he's supposed to throw and win. And then I think it'll be easier for him to develop some of these fun fundamental foundational techniques to help him do that and in a way that works for him and for Sark that Sark checks off on. So I, I'm optimistic that we'll see improvement just from that. But yeah, me too. Well, execution excellence, consistency, replicability. These are the hallmarks of a great college quarterback. These are also the hallmarks of a great mortgage guy. And there is a guy who has been a Texas fan, a member of the Texas family through and through for years. He supports Texas in every way you can think of, uh, whether it's advertising with us or my podcast, everyone gets a trophy podcast, or even NIL, where he's been very active. That guy is Gabe Winslow. You can reach him at 832-557-1095. He is brilliant at what he does, but he's also really consistent. This is a guy who works for himself. He's not working for a big bank, and he's not keeping bankers' hours. If you've got a problem at midnight, the day before you close, you pick up the phone and you call Gabe, and you're going to get Gabe, and he's going to solve the problem for you. Over 20 years in the industry, really sharp, really smart. I have dozens of testimonials from faithful Longhorn fans and others who have used him, and they have nothing but great things to say about him. If you want to, go check out his Google reviews. I think he's got like 140, and they're all five stars with like four paragraphs written about the amazing problem that Gabe solved. So great guy, great Longhorn. Let's support him. 832-557-1095, or you can go to mortgagesbygabe.com. So gentlemen, I did, I think, preview that Sark has had a great free throw shooter before in college, and he put up video game numbers, and his name was Mac Jones. And then when Mac Jones leveled up to the NFL, we realized he was a great free throw shooter. And the NFL asks you to hit 25-foot step backs. The NFL asks you to change hands in the lane and reverse jam to get your ball in, right? And Mac Jones can't do those things very well. Uh, but what he can do really well is hit his free throws. And Sark continuously devises offense and creates opportunities 
for quarterbacks to hit free throws. So is Quinn Ewers going to level up in 2024? Well, I think the answer to that question is, is he going to hit his free throws? If he does, this Texas offense is going to be a lot of fun to watch. I'm glad Rick Barnes isn't the coach anymore because if it, if we were relying on his free throw shooting coaching, we'd be in trouble. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't want to bring in Shaq as a consultant on that either. Now, by way of – we know Quinn's going to be the starter, but we've got a guy waiting in the wings named Arch Manning. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, Justin. Uh, the like, last name seems familiar, but – Fill me in. Yeah. Louisiana kid, uh, you know, kind of under the radar. No one's really heard of him. I guess his dad played at Ole Miss. I don't know. Private school? I mean, what do you yeah, expect? Private, private school, school guy. Yeah, doesn't doesn't have the chops. Here's the thing that is interesting about Arch and what's interesting about the Manning family. Peyton Manning didn't throw the most beautiful balls in NFL history, but consistency, duplicability, and replicability were his hallmarks as a passer. Same, you get those easy throws, it's going to get there, and it's going to get there on time. Eli Manning, probably one of the most classic quarterback like arms and, and, and motions and, and mechanics that you'll ever find. I mean, it's kind of beautiful, actually. Uh, simplistic. Very simplistic, but clean and efficient. Uh, Arch has some of those traits. He has a... a you could tell a, a throwing style that is very uh, replicable. So what's interesting, I think, about Arch may not just be the upside of his athleticism or his size and the things that we know about him that make him interesting. It could be the fact that this is the quarterback down the road who's going to be the most consistent guy who can hit your free throws but also step out and nail a three-pointer or – do a reverse jam in the lane on, on a fast break. So what do you guys think about Arch Manning as a guy that might marry well to some of the rhythm and timing of Steve Sarkeesian's offense down the road? Yeah. I mean, I think the fact that some of Sark's guys that are most, he's most famous for producing are much more the free throw guys like, um, Oh my gosh, Matt Leiner, Mac Jones, obviously uh, John David Booty. Uh, Cody Kessler. Yeah. These guys were not, they didn't, Mark Sanchez, they didn't do that much in the NFL for the reason that you gave. They got really proficient at just taking what Sark drew up for them and hitting it consistently and reliably. And uh, those are some of the, those have been some of his best guys. Like probably the two best offenses that Sark has coordinated or been the quarterback's coach around for was the Mac Jones, Alabama team. And then, Take your pick, one of those Matt Leiner squads at USC. For me, you know, it, you know, it's fun because I got to watch Quinn and Arch in high school. I watched them in a camp setting. I watched them in, you know, you know, in live bullets on Friday nights. Um, and 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 two, you you know, they're they're similar in some ways, but they really are different others. Arch is a lot more outgoing. Quinn is a little bit more of an introvert. But for Arch, I mean, Paul said it. His mechanics are very simple. They're very, there's no wasted motion and wasted energy. There's, it, there's a thought process that's going through his mind as he's moving around. You know, when he goes off platform, he doesn't change his arm angle. If anything, he, he shortens his, his, his release and it's more of a, of a of throwing, like throwing a dart, which is kind of what you want on the, when, when, when you're moving around and you've got linebackers chasing you. Uh, and, and another thing about Arch is he's kind of, you know, Quinn's a deceptive athlete. Arch is kind of a deceptive athlete. One of the games I caught him his senior year, he rushed for 82 yards because the defense literally played seven guys behind the linebackers, six or seven guys behind the linebackers. So he had to run a lot. And not to mention, he was probably the best passer and rebounder on their state championship basketball team. And so for me, Arch is just a creature of, of habit and routine. And the fact that he showed up in Austin already knowing the playbook and the terminology before he got into his dorm, it, the, the transition I feel like is going to be pretty easy. It's good. He's going to have a different element. He doesn't have that arm talent necessarily that Quinn does, but everything else he does is such a, a, a routine based thing that you can replicate. He's going to hit his free throws 
and he's going to hit his three-pointers. And that's, I think, what you need to maximize what Sark does. Another outstanding episode of The Deep Dive. We sure do appreciate everything from Ian Boyd to Paul Wadlington, but mainly the viewers. Thank you for making us a part of your day. Like and subscribe uh, the video for the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel. Help us climb. And then also use the promo code IT1 to get two months of InsideTexas.com for only a dollar. It really is a not a better time to join InsideTexas.com. Come see us. Spring game stuff, post, post, post spring game stuff, portal, recruiting. We've got it all. Thank you again for making us a part of your day. And come see us at InsideTexas.com, powered by the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel.